Okay, today we're going to be looking at a publicly published comparison contrast essay. This essay is not very long. The file says five pages, but if you go to the end, this is the fifth page. It ends right here. So it's really four pages. But we're going to spend uh, a bit more time looking at this essay because it's not very straightforward. It takes a bit of context and explanation. This essay is comparing the preparation process uh, for writing the inauguration speech of President Lincoln and President Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis was the first and only president of the Confederate States of America, which is the name of the South in the American Civil War. So this is an, uh, already a fascinating comparison, right? In 1861, the United States was divided into North and South two governments. Both governments had chosen a president and both presidents were going to uh, enter office. And before, uh, right after they enter office, they need to give a speech, uh, an inauguration speech. In Chinese, we call this zhou zi yan shuo. Uh, so this short essay is comparing the uh, preparation process and uh, attitude of these two speeches. And uh, its main point is that from the differences in preparation and attitude, you could already predict who would win the Civil War. Uh, so we start with Jefferson Davis in the South. Uh, by the way, this is a piece from a very, very long New York Times series on the Civil War. It, it's really interesting. They have, uh, on average, one essay for every day of the Civil War. The Civil War went from 1861 to 1865. That's five years. Uh, and this series has around one essay per day for five years. Hastily composed, which means that it was written very quickly. Montgomery, Alabama, February 18, 1861. Montgomery is the capital of Alabama state. Alabama is the state between, okay, so Florida, on top of Florida is Georgia. To the left of Georgia is Alabama, and to the left of Alabama is Mississippi. Like a feckless college student with a term paper deadline looming, Jefferson Davis apparently hadn't started write, seriously writing until the day before. So uh, feckless means useless uh, in describing a person. So like a useless college student with a deadline, Jefferson Davis only started writing seriously the day before he had to give his speech. Exhausted from a week-long railway journey, remember this is the 19th century, there were no airplanes, everybody took trains. So exhausted from a week-long railway journey, he had stayed in bed in his suite at the Exchange Hotel until after 10 a.m., then buckled down to work, which means he got down to work. Now, barely 24 hours later, standing in front of the Alabama State House's portico under a wintry sky, he unfolded a thin sheaf of paper and began to read his inaugural address in a strong, clear baritone. So after writing for only 24 hours, including sleep, uh, now he's standing in front of the Alabama State House. The State House is the place where the governor works. It's like the Capitol building. A portico is like a front porch with a ceiling. Uh, I guess in Chinese we call this like Chen Men Hui Lang or something. So he's standing uh, on, on top of the steps in front of the state house 
it's winter, right? It's November. Uh, and he unfolds a thin sheaf of paper. So it's not a very long speech, very short uh, speech. And he begins to read his inaugural address. Address here means speech. Inaugural means first. In a strong, clear baritone. Baritone is a low voice for men. Then we have a block quotation. This is taken from his speech. Gentlemen of the Congress of the Confederate States of America, friends and fellow citizens. So the Confederate States is the Southern States. Called to the difficult and responsible station of chief magistrate of the provisional government which you have instituted. So I have been called to be your president, basically. I approach the discharge of the duties assigned to me with humble distrust of my abilities. Uh, distrust, discharge, discharge of duties just means carrying out of duties or performing of duties. Distrust of my abilities, but with a sustaining confidence in the wisdom of those who uh, are to guide and aid me in the administration of public affairs and an abiding faith in the virtue and patriotism of the people. So how does he begin his speech? He says hello to the important people. Then he says that he, he um, he's humble. Uh, he's very modest, right? Maybe I won't do a good job myself, but I believe in everyone who trusts in me and who will help me in my job. And I also believe in the people. Sound, it seems like a good classic start. Davis had indeed been called. Uh, in Chinese, we call this Zhao Huan. Not exactly elected to the presidency, right? As he says, called to the position. Not exactly elected to the presidency. Just 10 days earlier, delegates which means representatives from six southern states meeting here in the Alabama capital had chosen him as the new Confederate nation's first chief executive, which means president. So Jefferson Davis is the president of the southern states, but he was not elected by the people. He was chosen by representatives from six states. Like so many of the South's actions that winter, the secession meetings, secession means uh, leaving the country, the state leaving the country. Uh, what do we call this in Chinese? That's not right. You know, like the decision to leave the country. Uh, secession meetings and ratifications. Ratification means you agree in law. So you don't just say you'll do it, but you will agree in the law. The drafting of a constitution. A new country needs a new constitution. The decision had been taken in haste. So the choice of Jefferson Davis, the decision to leave the U United States, the drafting of a new constitution were all done very quickly. Though several other men wanted the post, there had been almost no campaigning or debate. Davis's political and military experience were strong qualifications, certainly, but the most potent fact, the most powerful fact in his favor was probably that he had fewer enemies than his rivals. Uh, that does not seem like a good way to choose your president, the guy with the fewest enemies. Now he was not merely the Confederacy's chief magistrate or leader, but also its chief mouthpiece, Fai Yanren. Hitherto, which means up to that point, most statements on secession had come from individual states, but today, it devolved upon him, which means it was left to him, to explain to the world why the Deep South had announced 
its withdrawal from the Union. He said, another long quote, our present political position has been achieved in a manner unprecedented in the history of nations. This is true. The southern states were the first states, uh, were the first uh, case in modern history of one part of the country deciding to leave the country. It illustrates the American idea that governments rest on the consent of the governed. So like if the people don't agree with the government, then the government has no legitimacy. And that it is the right of the people to alter, which means change, or abolish, which means cancel, them at will whenever they become destructive of the ends for which they were established. So whenever the government is working against why people wanted this government in the first place. The impartial and enlightened verdict, verdict of mankind. So all of humanity with its objectivity and wisdom will vindicate the rectitude of our conduct, will confirm that we have done the right thing. And he, you see the capital H, this means God. He, God, who knows the hearts of men, will judge of the sincerity with which we have labored to preserve the government of our fathers in its spirit. So this last sentence is, has two parts. Did we do the right thing? Mankind, human, humankind will judge. Did we try to do the right thing? God will tell, will judge. Uh, and in this case, what is trying to do the right thing? Labor, which means try, to preserve the government of our fathers in its spirit. So even though they are leaving the United States, they think it is because the United States has strayed from its path, that the US government is no longer doing what it was supposed to do. Therefore, this new government would be the real government of their forefathers. Uh, it would be in the same spirit as the founding fathers of the country. So, it's <laughs> 北边政府，他们觉得南边政府觉得北边政府偏离了，所以要另外成立一个国家。他们自称自己国家才是延续美国精神的国家。Preserve the government of our fathers in its spirit. This was characteristic of the conservative tenor that pervaded Davis's address. Tenor means feeling. Uh, attitude, voice. Um, in Chinese, it was something like uh, that filled Davis's speech. So the point here is that the entire speech sounds similarly conservative. By his lights, which means in his view, the Confederacy though its manner of birth may have been unprecedented, was hardly novel or new in any significant respect. So even though the Confederacy is the first country to be founded by leaving another country, and that part is new, but the country itself, according to Davis, is nothing new. Respect here means aspect, mianxiang. Its constitution, he said, differs only from that of our fathers insofar as it is explanatory of their well-known intent. So the only main difference between the original constitution and the southern constitution is that the southern constitution explains more. But they mean the same thing, according to Davis. Uh, and if you don't know, constitution is xianfa. Freed from sectional conflicts. 
which have interfered with the pursuit of the general welfare. What does that mean? Sectional conflict means uh, arguments between different parts of the nation. So here he's saying that the original constitution is being interfered with by different groups of people arguing about what does it mean. And so the Southern Constitution is different only in that expla it explains things more clearly and so can avoid this kind of argument. Members of his audience might have been forgiven for scratching their heads at this last somewhat tortuous passage. Tortuous means winding, not straightforward. So the author is saying you don't understand that last sentence. Most people don't understand that last sentence either. So like, what does it mean? It was, in fact, a very delicate allusion to slavery. Delicate here means trying to be sensitive, trying not to be too blunt. Allusion means reference. To slavery. The founding fathers well known intent in Philadelphia in 1787. Uh, this is where the Constitution was written. Had been to protect slavery, Davis hinted. Even if they had not quite made it explicit. So with this last confusing sentence, well-known intent. Davis is saying that the original founding fathers wanted to put slavery in the Constitution, uh, but they were prevented from doing that. So the Southern Constitution will put slavery clearly in the words. Indeed, the American Constitution did not contain the word slave. Whereas the Confederate version defiantly repeated it 10 times, including in this crucial passage. No bill of attainder, ex post facto law, or law denying or impairing the right of property in Negro slaves shall be passed. So no A, B, or C kind of law shall be passed. What three kinds? A bill of attainder. This is a law of punishment from the legislature. So usually when the country wants to punish someone, they will arrest the person and send them to court, right? And then they will have a trial and a judge will, will say whether they should be punished. A bill of attainder is when the legislature, like Congress, passes a law directly punishing someone. No need to go through the courts. The second one, ex post facto, this is Latin, and it means from after the fact. Uh, so it means a law that applies to previous situations. Or the third one, a law denying or impairing, uh, impair means preventing the right of property in Negro slaves. So whether it's a regular law, a law after the fact, or a direct law of punishment, no law is allowed to hurt the right to own Negro slaves, black slaves. So this was directly written into the Southern Constitution. Uh, so if any Southern state wanted to abolish slavery, they couldn't just pass a law. They had to get everybody else to agree and to change the Constitution. So this is already one main difference between the Confederate Constitution and the original Constitution. As this paragraph says, the original Constitution did not even mention the word slave. Whereas the Confederate Constitution outright 
uh, prevented any law from changing the system of slavery. But unlike Davis's farewell speech to the Senate a month earlier, his inaugural speech included no clarion call to defend slavery and white supremacy. So he, in this speech, he did not clearly call people to defend slavery or white supremacy. White supremacy is the idea that white people are better than everyone else and deserve more rights. Even the South's favorite euphemism, Wei Wan Si, our domestic institutions, Guo Nei Zi Du, was left unuttered. It was not said in the speech. The closest he came was in attesting that the desire to form a new nation was actuated or motivated solely by the desire to preserve our own rights and promote our own welfare. Rights and welfare, obviously, had very specific connotations in this context. So even though the Southern Constitution uh, talked about slavery a lot, when Davis gave his first speech, he did not mention slavery. The closest that he came was to mention our own rights and our own welfare. And if you didn't know what he was talking about, you may not have realized he was talking about slavery. The closing lines were heavy with unintended irony, Feng Si. Davis read, it is joyous in the midst of perilous times or dangerous times to look around upon a people united in heart where one purpose of high resolve or determination animates and actuates or motivates the whole, uh, which means everyone where the sacrifices to be made are not weighed in the balance against honor and right and liberty and equality. Uh, they are not weighed, which means that they can all be done together. To be weighed in the balance against, in Chinese we call this 于什么做权衡. So if you're not weighed, that means you're not comparing them. You can do all of them. You can make the sacrifices and you can keep your honor and right and liberty and equality. Obstacles may retard or slow down, but they cannot long prevent the progress of a movement sanctified, which means made holy. Not that holy, H-O-L-Y, made sacred. Made sacred uh, by its justice and sustained by a virtuous people. You may do the renming. Reverently, which means uh, with religious feeling. Let us invoke the God of our fathers to guide and protect us in our efforts to perpetuate, which means continue, the principles which by his blessing they were able to vindicate, establish, and transmit to their posterity, which means people of later generations. With the continuance of his favor ever gratefully acknowledged, we may hopefully look forward to success, to peace, and to prosperity, Fan Rong. So what is this paragraph saying? He's saying we may be facing danger, but when I see that everyone is determined and agrees on what to do, I believe that we can make sacrifices and keep our honor and freedom and equality. There may be obstacles, but they cannot stop us when we have God on our side and we are uh, pursuing the same goals as the original founding fathers. And so let us thank God and hope that he will continue to support us so that we may have success, peace, and prosperity. Now, the author of this essay says that it is full of irony. And the reason is mainly because 
this speech was given just before the Civil War started. So the last thing that they have is success and peace and prosperity. And with that, having spoken for barely 15 minutes, he concluded. The inaugural address had contained not a single memorable phrase or idea. Even Davis's admirers would rarely quote it. So up to this point, the essay has been talking about all of the problems or uh, strange parts of this speech. Davis spent just one day writing it. He didn't mention the main point of the southern states, which is slavery. And his final hopes for their new country were later proven to be false. And also the, the speech was very short. The address was most notable for what it left out. Any attempt to explain how a nation could possibly remain viable or possible, let alone democratic, if it were founded on the principle that any constituent part might withdraw as soon as it found itself in the minority on an important political issue. So here the author is talking about this part. Uh, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish the government at will whenever it becomes destructive of the ends for which it was established. So when people think that the government is not working for the people, they can change it or they can cancel it. Sounds nice, but how do you do that actually? This is what the author is saying. How could a country exist and even be a democratic country if the people can choose to cancel the government at any time? How would that kind of country continue to work? This is something that Davis did not explain in his speech. This was the fundamental philosophical absurdity. On which the whole Confederacy was constructed. Like a grandiose classical edifice on a foundation of sand. Like you're building a grand, beautiful building on sand. The new president's failure to address it did not bode well, so it was not a good sign. Indeed, it was an early symptom of a fatal condition. It is instructive to compare Davis's inaugural address and its method of composition with Abraham Lincoln's two weeks later. OK, so now we're getting into the main comparison. And the author says that we will compare the speech and the composition, how it was written. Uh, so Davis gave his speech first, and then two weeks later, Lincoln gave his speech. Lincoln had begun work on his speech not long after his election. By late January, he had buckled down in earnest, so he had gotten to work, uh, hard work. Hiding out in a small room in a shop belonging to his brother-in-law, where he would not be disturbed. Uh, Lincoln was a lawyer, so he had asked his law partner, William Herndon, to procure or acquire Trude, copies of Henry Clay's 1850 address to the Senate, Daniel Webster's debates with Senator Robert Hayne of South Carolina, Andrew Jackson's statement against nullification, George Washington's farewell address, and the Constitution. These are all important political documents. Uh, the first two speeches are against secession, 
So against the idea that you can leave the country if you don't agree. The third one, Andrew Jackson was a former president. During his time as president, South Carolina tried to argue that because they believed a law was unjust, they could ignore the law. In Chinese, we call this e fa fei fa. Uh, and so the president, Andrew Jackson, argued against them and succeeded. So the idea that you don't have to follow a bad law is called nullification. Null means nothing, empty, powerless. So to nullify means to make powerless. So this is the idea that a bad law has no power. George Washington's farewell address is uh, one of Washington's most famous speeches. Um, at the beginning of the United States, there was no limit on how many times someone could be president. Uh, the limit was only set in law after Franklin D. Roosevelt, Xiao Fu, got elected four times and he died in office during his fourth term. After that, uh, a law was passed limiting presidents to only two terms. So in the beginning, uh, Washington was elected once by everyone. It was unanimous. He was re-elected again, unanimous. Nobody disagreed. And so Washington realized if he kept running for president, people would keep supporting him. And so in the end, he would just be like another king. So why did they have to leave England and start their own country if they were just going to do the same things that England did? So Washington, at the end of his second term, decided to retire. And this was a new thing. I mean, Washington was the first president. Everything he did was a new thing. So he was the first president who to decide not to have a third term of office. And he gave a speech explaining himself. And because uh, up until the Second World War, every president followed this convention, even though there was no law. So the basis of this convention was that speech. Because Washington gave this speech, for the next hundred years, nobody became president for a third time. So it's a very important speech. And then, of course, the most important thing of all, the Constitution. So our first main comparison, Jefferson Davis woke up at 10 a.m. and started writing his speech. Lincoln got elected two months previous, asked his partner to gather different important materials, and he researched and planned and worked on his speech for two months or six weeks here. Lincoln would continue working on the address over the course of six weeks until the very morning of his swearing in. Uh, to swear in means you put your hand on the Bible, you give the oath, and be, therefore you become, uh, in this case, the president. It's called a swearing in because you have to swear that you will uphold and defend the Constitution, etc. So up until he became president, he was still working on his speech. That's the first main difference. It was not hastily composed. The thinness of Davis's speech and of his preparation cannot be blamed merely on haste or inattention. So the fact that Davis's speech was so short, the fact that he prepared so quickly cannot be blamed entirely on the his urge to hurry or his lack of attention. Rather, rather, it betrayed an alarming void at the center of the self-proclaimed Confederate Republic. So the author is saying another reason why Davis seemed to have little to say 
is because the center of the idea of the Confederacy was a void. It was empty. There was nothing at the center. The hard work that Lincoln had put into his message attested to his faith in the power and necessity of words, of arguments, of explanations in a democratic system. By contrast, the lackluster, which means is the opposite of like brilliant and bright, so like a, a mediocre, shop-worn rhetoric of Davis and other leaders. Shop-worn means cliche, was not merely a failure of aesthetics, but proof of the intellectual poverty and moral laziness undergirding their entire enterprise. So this sentence is saying that uh, Davis prepared little and gave a short speech, mainly not because he was lazy, but because his government itself was built on a bad foundation. Intellectual poverty, not a lot of thought went into their system of government. Moral laziness, not a lot of thought went into what is the right thing to do. Enterprise here just means effort. It also revealed their lack of commitment to the essential democratic chores of persuasion and explanation. Uh, so the fact that Davis did not feel like he had to say a lot also tells us that he didn't really care about trying to persuade and explain to ordinary people what was going on. And these are the fundamental democratic chores or duties. If you live in a democracy, you need the support of the people, so you need to let the people know what you're trying to do and to help persuade them to agree with you. But apparently Davis and other Confederate leaders did not care too much about this part. The Confederacy was never truly much of a cause. Cause here means a belief, uh, um, a political belief, lost or otherwise. OK, this will take some explanation. So. Um, after the South lost the war. Some Southerners started to argue that. They would have won the war, except that the North. Um, like used unfair strategies or like uh, destroyed the economy or like convinced slaves to fight for the North. In other words, it was not a fair fight, but that really the right side was the South. This idea is known as the lost cause. So here the author is saying, uh, lost or not, there was no real cause for the Confederacy. In fact, it might better be called an effect, a reactive stratagem or strategy, tarted up, which means decorated, with ex post facto justifications. So it's saying that the Confederacy did not really have a belief. It was in fact a reaction uh, to the situation that was only later decorated with uh, reasons and ideas that were not really central to the country itself. This would soon be borne out, be proven, in the practices of the two national legislatures. A legislature is the body that passes laws, Guohui. Over the next four years, the Confederate Congress would transact nearly all of its important business in secret. And even some of the most fervent, which means passionate, secessionists 
would decry its lack of true accountability to the southern public. And then in this parentheses is a is an example. Robert Barnwell Rett of South Carolina, which is a southern state, a leading fire eater in 1860 and 1861. Um, a fire eater is someone who argues passionately for leaving the United States. Would later blame the South's loss on the absence of any informed public debate within the Confederacy that might have held the Davis administration's policies up to scrutiny. To hold something up to scrutiny means to let everybody examine this thing. So this guy who supported the South argued that the South lost because the government's policies were not open to the people, and so the people could not examine the policies and could not point out mistakes. By contrast, the Congress of the United States, which is the northern part, notwithstanding all the bitter infighting that lay ahead, so even though they argued among each other and they fought with each other, even though would never once go into closed session during the course of the war. Uh, so in Congress a, or court, a closed session is where the public is not allowed. So here the author is saying the Southern government mostly did its business without letting people see them do it. Whereas in the North, not a single time did Congress ban people from listening to their discussions. Let's take a short break and we'll finish this in the next period.
So in this paragraph, we just saw that a main difference between the northern and southern governments is in how open they are to the public. The southern government uh, didn't try to let people see what they were doing. In fact, they did all its important business in secret. And some people believe that this was one reason why the South lost, that the policies were not open to examination and correction by the public. On the other hand, the US government in the North did everything in the open. Every single meeting was open to the public. So on this basis in the last paragraph, in fact, the most revealing words in the two contrasting inaugural addresses may have been those that came at the very beginning. Davis had opened his with gentlemen of the Congress of the Confederate States of America, friends and fellow citizens. Don't you? Jefferson Davis had opened his speech with gentlemen of the Congress of the Confederate States of America, friends and fellow citizens. A catalog of castes, right? First, the Congress, and then friends, and then finally, citizens. Three groups of people. Lincoln, though addressing an equally august assemblage, which means equally like important group of people, would begin his speech much more simply and democratically, fellow citizens of the United States. So this author is saying that from the way that Davis prepared his speech and from the emphasis of the two speeches, you could see a difference in the two governments attitude toward the people. And from that difference, you could predict how much support each government might have, and therefore who was the stronger government and who was more likely to win the civil war. And to make this point, the author took a close look at Jefferson Davis's speech, pointing out um, how briefly he prepared the speech, pointing out that Davis was not elected, he was chosen by a group of representatives, that he was chosen for the simple reason that he had fewer enemies than the other people, and that this choice was made very quickly, just like the decision to leave the country was made very quickly, just like the new constitution was written very quickly. And some signs of how fast uh, this happened are in Davis's speech itself. Although the entire basis of the Confederate government was slavery, and its constitution mentions slavery 10 times, including passing a specific point that does not allow any individual state to change or abolish slavery. So even though slavery was such an important part of the sovereign, uh, Southern government, 
in Davis's speech, he did not mention slavery at all. He, don't, he did not mention slavery. He did not mention the idea behind slavery, which is that white people are better. He didn't even use the common phrase related to slavery, our domestic institutions, meaning the southern system of slavery. The closest he came to mentioning slavery, this most important idea for the South, is that he says the government was motivated by the desire to preserve our own rights and promote our own welfare. And only if you knew that the main difference between North and South was slavery, would you understand that by rights, he meant the right to own slaves, and by welfare, he meant the benefit and welfare of people who owned slaves. So if we say that the Southern government had some kind of central idea, then it's probably the right to slavery. And yet in Davis's speech, he did not mention that central idea even once. And from this point, the author of this essay says that we can see Davis was not just in a hurry. He was not uh, suffering from inability. He is not being careless. He is trying to thread a needle. He's trying to be very careful about how he talked about this new country. Everybody at the time argued that it was in support of the right for each state to own slaves. And yet Davis did not mention this idea. And it is probably because, according to the author, this is not really much of a political idea. And this goes back to the idea of a lost cause. In American history, southern states later developed the idea that the right for each state to decide whether to stay in the country and to decide whether people should be allowed to own slaves is a fundamental right, is a fundamental freedom of each individual state. And if this idea is correct, then in the Civil War, it is the southern states who were correct. And the northern states who prevented the South from leaving were in the wrong. Now, this idea, the author also points out how ridiculous it is. Because here, as the author says, how could a nation possibly remain viable or workable? How could such a country work if it is founded on the principle that any part could withdraw as soon it, as it was in the minority on a political issue? If it is true that any state could leave the country when they felt like the government was not supporting them, then in a normal democratic system, when different people would have different opinions about different issues, then any time a single state disagreed with what they believed was an important issue, they could straightforwardly leave the country. If this was true, then what kind of country would be left? And even people at the time knew that this kind of system would never work in the long term. And so by pointing this out, the author of this essay is also pointing out why the idea that the South was correct is in fact wrong. The, the idea of a lost cause is that the South was not fighting for slavery. It was fighting for the right of individual states to decide to leave the country if they felt like they needed to. But as the author says, this idea does not make sense. And therefore, the South could only have been defending slavery. But at the time, many leaders of the Confederacy knew that 
uh, there was international opposition to slavery. Even England had already abolished slavery a few decades ago. And so when the southern government was formed, the thing that they needed the most was international support, international recognition. They had to find countries that were willing to work with them and to trade with them so that they could have enough money to fight the war. So in order to win support from other countries, they had to emphasize the legal aspect, the ideals of the country instead of defending slavery. So yes, when the Southern government was formed and each individual state passed a law leaving the United States and joining this new country, they had to persuade the people. And so the reason they gave the people is in order to defend slavery. But then when they had to get other countries to support them, they had to emphasize a different point because slavery is deeply unpopular on the international stage. So they turned to emphasize individual states' rights. But as the author points out, states' rights is just a fiction in this sense. If states' rights really did happen, then the country would not survive uh, over the long term. And also because the southern government used a different reason for its own people and for the international community, when it, Davis was giving his speech, he could not mention slavery so clearly. When the southern government is making its decisions and meeting and passing laws, they knew that they had to do two completely opposite things. On the one hand, to protect slavery. On the other hand, not to emphasize this fact. And so most of their business was done in secret. Uh, the South cared more about maintaining the system of slavery and therefore maintaining the system of power. And not as much about being open and democratic and having the support of the people. And so that's why at the end the author says that the most revealing words in the two speeches are in the opening. Whereas Davis, who, sorry, let's go from the other side. Whereas Lincoln, who supports an openly democratic system, started his speech by simply calling everyone a citizen. Davis, who led a government focused on maintaining power and differences, separated his people into different groups. First, the most important group, Congress, then his friends, and then finally, ordinary citizens. This list, this difference itself reflects a different idea of who makes up a country. Are they all equal to each other? How much importance does each group have for the country and for the leadership? How much influence does each group have? And it looks like by separating people into three groups like this, Davis is implying that the first group has the most power and influence, and the third group does not matter very much. And this is opposite to the spirit of democracy as promoted in the northern states. Uh, and this fits very well with the attitude of the Southern Congress. So it's not just Davis, right? Davis is one person giving one speech. It's also true of most leaders in the South who had real power to pass real laws. They did all their business in secret, and the only thing that people could see was the result. The final law passed, but you couldn't see why or what changes were made. You couldn't see who supported which part of the law. You couldn't see 
the original intent of the first person to propose the law. You didn't see the process. There was no accountability. You could not check that your government truly was working for you. You were just an ordinary person who took orders from the government and that's it. And this is even reflected in how the South chooses its leaders. As the author mentions, Jefferson Davis was the country's president, but he wasn't elected. Instead of having the whole country choose one leader, the six states that made up the Confederacy at that time each sent representatives, and those representatives chose the president. Now, to us today, that sounds crazy, right? How could you call this a democracy? But even at that time, the North also was not a direct democracy. Even in the North, they did not choose their president directly. According to the original US Constitution, the president is chosen indirectly. The people of each state elect uh, state senators for each state, and the senators choose the president. Um, and later this was changed to the Electoral College. This is why in America, it is possible even today for someone to win more votes, but still lose the election. Because according to the US law, people are not voting for the president. People are voting for people from their own state to send to Washington to choose a president. And it is merely expected that the people you choose will vote for the person you choose on the vote. So the South, in fact, this their system of choosing a president is, all, is still very similar to how the North chose its president at the time, except that, as the author says, these people from the six states are delegates. A delegate is a representative who is chosen by a leader, not by a people. If a representative is chosen by people, it is called a representative. A delegate is chosen by leaders. This means that the people who ultimately chose Davis as their president were the six governors, not the people, the governors. So in fact, this system of choosing a president is one layer removed from the people more than the North. In the North, you choose your senator and your senator chooses a president. In the South, you choose a governor, the governor chooses the delegates, and the delegates choose the president. It's even less democratic. In the end, though, it doesn't really matter how Davis was chosen because he probably wasn't a very good politician. The reason that he was chosen is because he had fewer enemies than his rivals. Um, and so we see here the downside of not having a democratic process, which is that the people are not given the chance to evaluate how good a politician or leader Davis is. He probably was OK, not too good, but not too bad. He had political and military experience. But in the end, the reason he was chosen by these delegates from the six states in a very non-democratic process is not because he was the better leader, but because he had fewer enemies. Now, is this a sign of good leadership to not have enemies? I would say not necessarily. A good leader sometimes has to make hard decisions. And hard decisions are decisions that create enemies for from the losing side. So the fact that Davis had fewer enemies than anyone else tells me that he is more caring about being popular than he is about making the right decisions, even if they are hard decisions. 
And so the people who would choose this kind of leader also probably don't have strong beliefs that they want to defend or promote. In a country that has strong beliefs, like for example, the northern states, when the US was founded, their belief was not just we don't want to follow England. Their belief was that there should not be a king. That the people should be able to choose their leader. This was a strong belief. This was something that most people could support. And so they chose a president not because he was most popular and he didn't make people angry. The US chose George Washington as their first president because he was the military leader. He was the guiding force in promoting the ideas of the new country. Even though he did have enemies, in fact, he had a, quite a few enemies, they chose him as their leader because they believed in what he was promoting. But Davis is the opposite. The South knew that they were defending an old system, a system of oppression of black people, and it was not something that everyone would agree with. It was not a powerful ideal. It was not something that could get international support. So instead of choosing a strong leader who could promote their ideals and could gather support, they chose someone with the fewest enemies, which means that they're not hoping for more support. They're simply trying to prevent people from stopping their support. So all of these points, Davis writing his speech very quickly and very unclearly, the fact that he was chosen by a non-democratic process, the fact that he was chosen in a defensive maneuver instead of to promote ideas, the fact that the in his speech, he divided people into three groups and he did not talk about the key point of the country, which is slavery. The fact that the Southern Congress did all of its business in secret, did not allow the public to see what was going on and only presented their results to the public as a kind of order and conclusion. All of these ideas, according to the author of this essay, point to the fact that the South was always more likely to uh, be going to lose the war. If it didn't have popular support, if it didn't have a working correction mechanism, if its leader was chosen to avoid fighting instead of to win the fight, it did not say good things about the future of this country. So we've looked at a comparison contrast essay. How does this essay work? How is it structured? What does it compare? How does it compare it? The main comparison is between the values of the southern states and the values of the northern states. But the values are abstract. You can talk about them and people may not understand what you're talking about. Or you might talk about values and there might be more than one way to support a value with concrete actions. So instead of being abstract, the author focuses on a specific moment of comparison. The first speeches of Southern President Jefferson Davis and Northern President Abraham Lincoln. The author focuses on the writing process, the opening of the speech, and uh, the main content of the Southern speech. This essay is written for an American audience, and so Americans are probably more familiar with Lincoln's speech than they are with Davis's speech. So the author decided not to spend time comparing the main body of the two speeches. And as um, a kind of introduction, 
it focuses on Davis first. We are, or the reader is supposedly more familiar with Lincoln's speech and with his ideas and with his attitude. So in order to attract the reader's interest, the author starts with the less familiar part of the comparison, Jefferson Davis. And because this is a process, we actually get a kind of story, right? It starts by saying that Davis is like a college student who doesn't know what he's doing. He has a deadline, and so he starts writing his speech the day before. Uh, and it tells us why he was starting so late. And it is because he had taken a long train journey. He didn't have much energy. But then again, he was taking a train journey for many weeks. For a whole week. Why didn't he write his speech on his journey? That also seems like uh, something that a good leader would try to do. Indeed, near the end of this essay, we see that Lincoln had begun work soon after he was elected. He continued working on his speech for six weeks while he was traveling, while he was making plans, while he was preparing to become president. He kept on working on his speech, trying to make it better. Whereas Jefferson Davis barely spent a day on that speech and the speech itself was not much. It was a very thin stack of papers. In contrast, when Lincoln was preparing his speech, he asked his friend to gather some important documents for him. He wanted to make sure that his speech was filled with important ideas so that it would be a good speech, people would agree with him, and would therefore support his government. Some of the documents that Lincoln asked for included important speeches to the Senate, important debates, a presidential statement, George Washington's famous speech, and the Constitution itself. All of these documents are related to the idea motivating the Civil War. Should a part of the country be allowed to leave the country simply because they don't agree with the main majority ideas? And all of these documents say no. So when Lincoln is explaining his position, he's not just using his own ideas. He is drawing on the ideas expressed by famous and intelligent people who had spoken before him. He's trying to make his speech as good as it can. Then we so this is the preparation part of the comparison. Then we have the opening of the speech, and the author focuses on this near the end of the essay also. When Davis opens his speech, he addresses gentlemen of the Congress, friends, and fellow citizens, three different groups, as if there were a difference between these people. Kind of like how today, if you give a speech in public, you would say, like, dear president, dear professors, um, fellow, uh, fellow students, right, in that order, from most important to regular people. But Davis is supposed to be the president of a country, a democratic country, where everyone is equal to everyone else as long as you're white. So the fact that he was not able to speak to everybody in the same way tells us that he did not think of these people as equally important. Whereas Lincoln started his speech by calling everybody the same, fellow citizens. Doesn't matter if you're in Congress 
doesn't matter if you're vice president, doesn't matter if you're a gardener. Everybody is a fellow citizen. Everybody is equally important. That is the democratic spirit. And so this difference in thinking about the body politic and thinking about the division of the population is developed in this essay by the author into different attitudes toward the country and toward leadership. And this is where most of the essay talks about um, how Davis was chosen in a non-democratic way, how secession itself, the decision to leave the country itself, was decided very quickly uh, with little uh, certain democratic input. And why Davis was chosen, not for a good democratic reason, but for a kind of like backroom power haggling kind of defensive maneuver. And this also, this attitude towards the ordinary people, not including ordinary people in public discussions, also explains why Davis did not talk about slavery in his speech. He talked about high ideals of states' rights, but he did not talk about the specific point that most Southerners cared about. All of this uh, reflects the different attitudes toward the people on the part of Davis and Lincoln. And so with the author mounting such a case against Davis, the ending uh, is like the cherry on top, which is that because Davis started off on the wrong foot, he holds the wrong ideas. So when he says he looks forward to success, peace, and prosperity, these are precisely the things that the South does not get at the end. If you don't start well, you probably don't end well. And so there wasn't a lot to say, and so he didn't say much, only 15 minutes. So we see that a good comparison contrast essay doesn't just say, oh, like these two things are different like this and different like that. It explains why this difference is important. Why should we care about these two things that you are putting together? Why should we care that they are similar in some ways? Why should we care that they are different in some ways? In this essay, the emphasis is on the difference. The similarities are clear. Both are presidents, both are giving their first speeches, and both are trying to present a case to support their own government. But the differences are in the length of the speech, the content of the speech, the opening of the speech, and in the ideas that are being presented through the speech. And because these differences are so big, the ideas themselves, this beginning difference leads finally to the main difference at the end of the Civil War. One side loses, the other side wins. So inherent in this essay is the idea that the military success of a country is connected to the ideological success of a country. That a country with the right beliefs and the right procedures are more likely to win the war. Now, that's not necessarily true. There are, have been many different studies about the other differences between North and South. Most people today think that the North won for two main reasons. One, because most of the industry was in the North, and war depends on industry. You have to make guns, you have to make weapons. And second, because the North decided to set free all of the black slaves that they came across in the South. So that created a snowball effect. The more territory they conquered or liberated, or I guess reunified, the more black 
people joined the northern army and the bigger the northern army got. Uh, now, of course, you could say that this is connected with their attitudes towards slavery. Black people would not join the North if the North also defended slavery. Uh, and that is true. But the North had to actively make the decision to allow black people to fight for them. And this only happened in the middle of the war in 1863. So yes, ideology is related to the ultimate success of the North, but it also depends on the individual leadership decisions. In either case, according to this essay, the South had worse ideology and a worse leader, and so it was always likely that they would lose. Now that the video camera is gone, do you have any questions? Yes. A defensive maneuver. An action that you take for a defensive purpose, not in order to attack or to change the situation. Yes. Thank you. Other questions? OK, so um, this week you should have already submitted the final draft of your cause effect essay to Moodle, and I will try to find time to grade those. Uh, the score for the cause effect essay will be included in your daily grade by the end of the semester. Next week, you have to hand in a paper copy of your comparison contrast essay. And in class, we will watch a movie. I have not yet decided which movie. It will probably be a movie I have also not seen before. Uh, and there will be. Chinese subtitles. OK, questions about next week. Wait, I think we move too fast. Next week is peer review. Right, right, OK, sorry. Next week is peer review. So write out your comparison contrast essays. Uh, meet with your group members to discuss when uh, you want to set the deadline, and then next week come here to discuss your essays. Okay, I'll give you the rest of the time today to meet with your group members and to set a deadline.